45, maximum at 45. So please keep this thing in mind and let us start. All right. So, Jai Janedra, everyone, and I welcome you to this uh, online monthly lecture series. This is our ninth edition. And see, time is fleet. We have completed nine editions. Today, we have uh, an emerging scholar with us, Dr. Michael Chase, who will present her talk on Confronting Asceticism, Law, Gender, and the Right to Life in Contemporary Sallekhna. It's a very new topic. We are all interested in listening to it. And we have an established scholar to chair the program, Dr. Sushma Singhvi. I welcome the chair and I welcome the speaker today. And I also welcome all of you to the uh, program. Before we go ahead with the program, let us recite Anamukar Mantra. Please join your hands. Namo Arihantaram, Namo Siddharam, Namo Ayariyanam, Namo Vachayanam, Namo Loe Savvisahunam, Eso Panchinamo Kyaro, Savvapavapanasano, Mangalanam Chasavvesim, Padamam Havai Mangalam Dinirat made a swami. May have an eye bow. They hunt the case of my me to make on a pool a jam. Their matumani cut a hoe. Cherita the rum sunave. Vesa with honor at the king. Gafil na hoe. They so I think we are all in the groove of Salekna and uh, I would invite our uh, uh, director, Dr. Srinetra Pandey, to welcome you all formally and introduce the speaker and the chair today, Dr. Pandey. Thank you, Gary. I am glad to welcome you all to this virtual platform of International School for Jain Studies. Uh, as you all are aware that in 2005, ISGS started its journey with uh, summer schools. And uh, during the academic years, we organized workshops and seminars. And after that, we started organizing our winter schools at Ahmedabad and then we shifted towards many online programs on, on Jainism and uh, Prakrit. And again, we, uh, as next initiative, we started our nine month Prakrit Fellowship Program that is called Bhagwan Mahavir Prakrit Fellowship Program. Then we started some projects, research projects on Prakrit, Jainism, and uh, right now at ISJS, a uh, project of translation of Prakrit Hemchandra grammar. So it's going to be complete very soon. And four scholars are working on uh, English translation of dictionary uh, Pai Sabda Mahalo by Seth Harbobin Das. And as a new initiative, we just started our first Bhagavan Naminath Fellowship Program for research and writing skills. And I am very pleased to inform you all that after a certain process, we selected six participants. And I am fortunate to have these six scholars on different, from different backgrounds with a common interest in Jainism. So uh, we are organizing this program in association with Loyola Murray Point University, California. And here as a uh, main instructor, key instructor, we have a renowned scholar for particularly for research and writing skill, Dr. Swasti Patachari from USA. So 
and yes you are aware that uh, this is the ninth program we started just in 22 not 22 20 23rd yes february 23rd we started online monthly lecture series and we are here uh, for ninth lecture of this series on sanlekhana with dr nikhil chesh we have already shared a brief cv of the speaker and uh, our chair dr sushma singh ji but in a uh, brief i would like to uh, inform few things about miki and uh, sushma ji says an assistant professor and sri anantanath chair in jain studies in the department of asian languages and cultures at the university of wisconsin medicine previously she was the inaugural bhagwan muni subrat swami post doctoral fellow she did her phd in anthropology from johns hopkins university and in her entire research journey her main focus is on the ethics of death and dying and she uh, she had i think spent many years in india for field work and research and she works with many jain scholars in india for her research and she uh, joined our six week program so she is our alumnus uh, yes yes alumnus so we are very fortunate to have our alumnus as a speaker for this program so miki i welcome you on behalf of myself and behalf of international school for jain studies professor sushma ji is a well known scholar of jainology prakrit and uh, sanskrit and currently she is emeritus professor at uh, uh, department of prakrit and sanskrit at jain vishwa bharati and she has been the director of prakrit bharati academy jaipur chairman of rajasthan sanskrit academy and uh, she is retired from uh, jain arayan vyas university jodhpur she has been recipient of many uh, national awards and uh, honors and bhagwan acharya kund kund award by times india group is one of them and she is associated with isjs for a long time so she is uh, one of the our key faculty so i am uh, pleased to honor our own faculty dr sushma ji yaf of myself and yaf of isjs i welcome my president dr sugan ji uh, our advisors sulekh ji narendra parsan ji uh, prakash chand jain ji i can see here many scholars dr srinivasan ji from uh, madurai there are so many scholars i bakul ji bakul mataria ji i welcome you all once again i welcome you from behalf of myself and behalf of isjs thank you over to you pragya ji thank you dr pande for welcoming all the people over here um, formally now uh, with the permission of the chair i would uh, request dr miki chase to start her talk i will tell the topic again it's confronting asceticism law gender and the right to life in contemporary sarlekhna dr miki thank you so much okay let me share my screen uh, Okay, is it visible to everyone? Wonderful. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you so so much um to everyone who has joined the talk today and especially to Dr. Pandeji for the kind invitation um for organizing this wonderful lecture series. 
um, to um, Prague Ji for the introduction um, to Shugan Ji and Sushil Ji for all of their work um, with ISJS. Uh, and Dr. Sushma Singhvi for all her work at the Prakrit Bharti Academy, which was quite fundamental to a lot of my own field work while I was in Jaipur. Um, for about two years, I was doing my field work in, in India, in Jaipur, in Mumbai, and, and in Delhi. Um, and, and there are so many here today, I see, who have made my journey in Jainism and into Jain study is possible. So I, I want to extend my, my heartfelt thanks. Um, I myself, as uh, Dr. Pandeji mentioned, went through the ISJS six week program uh, relatively recently in, in 2019. While I was doing my field work, uh, my dissertation field work as a doctoral candidate in anthropology at the Johns Hopkins University. And the focus of my research, which is now the basis of my current book project, was an ethnographic study of the contemporary practice of Salikna, the ritual fast until death, uh, also known as Santara or Samadhi Maran, which has been described in English as the Jain art of dying or death with equanimity. And as an anthropologist, my thinking about religion is attentive to how doctrinal ideals and concepts are sustained as they come to be embodied in everyday life and practice, how it is that Jain ethics are brought to bear within their social contexts and move between social contexts. Now, these questions about how doctrinal ideals and concepts are embodied in everyday life with regard to Salekna are layered with the demands and the pressures that have come from legal contestation of the fast in public interest litigation, the case Nikhil Soni, the Union of India and others, as well as intense media scrutiny uh, and international attention that the fast then garnered. So my talk today is confined to the part of my work that explores how Salekna becomes an object of study or critique, and especially how it is situated in the legal realm or legal discourse. So later on in my talk, I'll reflect on the ways that the analogical reasoning in legal discourse suggests certain ethical questions that ethnography is well positioned to respond to. And I'll conclude with some reflections on the importance of expanding scholarship on Salikna to include what I call the, uh, what I refer to here as the genealogical method within anthropology and ethnographic work from the field. So I won't actually focus on the ethnography itself uh, today, but I am happy to answer questions about it uh, during the Q&A afterwards. So first, to situate Salekna as a practice within the Jain tradition, the ethical practices of Jainism are broadly understood as tapas, or the penance and austerity of asceticism, and its inscription on the body. And through tapas, the jiva or the soul in a human form is able to stop ashrava, the influx of karmic matter that binds the soul to samsara and worldly existence. So enacting samvara to burn away the existing karmas to the soul, nirjara, and counteracting bondage or bandha. And eventually, in accord with Samyak Darshan, Samyak Gyan, and Samyak Charitra, the right view or understanding, right knowledge, and right conduct, it is through Samyak Tapa, or right ascetic practice, that an individual might attain moksha or liberation. So this ethical framework of Jainism, which I've just said in, in incredibly brief terms here, um, situates uh, an ascetic mode for understanding Salekna, in which the ideal relation to the world is realized through complete withdrawal from it, so as to wholly fulfill as much as possible the central commitment to ahimsa or nonviolence. This commitment to nonviolence in the Jain form of life is mirrored in the notion of Salekna as a supremely nonviolent death. And this ascetic ethic is modeled after the 24 Tirthankaras who are venerated as having preached the Jain Dharma and shown the path to liberation. 
is imagined most ideally uh, in, in everyday life as embodied in mendicancy, uh, the path of the acharyas, the munis, the sadhus and sadhis, right, monks and nuns. But myriad commitments to asceticism also saturate the texture of life and practice for lay Janes, and particularly for women in their roles within the household and their relationships to managing the household and food and diet. So I won't spend too much time here elaborating on the enumerations of tapas as internal and external practice, except to note that fasting or upvas is frequently stated to be the most important ascetic penance. So salekna is ideally conceived then as the ultimate and final culmination of a lifetime of ascetic practice, where the body is finally abandoned through an individual's enactment of a carefully curated and canonically prescribed process of progressively abstaining from food and liquid and ultimately water. By bridging the material and the ideal, the fast is a way of dispassionately accepting and participating in our inevitable bodily undoing, our mortality. Impermanence of the body and the transience of life is meant to be experienced here as neither agonizing nor especially desirable. So one should not be averse to death, nor should one be desperate for death. And this is a reality uh, of this impermanence of the body and transience of life that is acknowledged by all Jains and indeed quite widely in, in Indian and South Asian religious traditions, but it is endured in Salekna only by individuals who possess tremendous determination and the devout resolve to give themselves over to this reality. It's undertaken as an optional vow rather than an obligatory vow. And it is available to both mendicants and to properly prepared householders who take this pachkan, this vow or oath or commitment. And at its most basic, salekna is a voluntary fast until death. It's undertaken by gradually reducing the intake of food and liquids uh, so as to purify karma as previously described and become detached from the physical body. So there's a recognition here of the ever-changing nature of reality aside from the soul and its aim toward liberation. And I'll briefly note here that according to Jane cosmology, in which cosmological time is structured in ascending and descending cycles, we're currently in the Panchamakala, the fifth ara or age of the descending cycle, which begins after the liberation of Mahavira. So because human morality is in decline in this descending age, achieving moksha or liberation by any means is currently considered by most Jain authorities to be impossible. Uh, so that means that even with Salekna, moksha is not considered possible in this lifetime in our current cosmological age. So although it is practiced with the aim of liberation, in reality, these limitations make it so that the best possible outcome is an auspicious rebirth where moksha will be possible, for example, in a, a karma bhumi. To provide some context for understanding the doctrinal picture of the, the fast and some of these sectarian distinctions in practice, uh, I want to begin with a note on the threefold concept practices that I believe should be taken into account in considering the sort of etymological implications of how we refer to the fast until death. Um, and, and especially how those cross over into English language scholarship in thinking about how the fast is conceptualized and how it's practiced. Digumbar Jains largely use the Sanskrit term salekna to refer to the fast until death. Uh, so it's derived from the word sam or right way and lekna, thinning out a reduction or an emaciation. And this term refers to the process of giving up the body in all ways both its material sustenance and the passions or kashyas that produce karma binding the human soul to the cycle of samsara. So on the physical level, the body is emaciated by tapas, the external austerities of fasting and renouncing nourishment. And on the spiritual level, meditation and reflection lessen the passions, the anger, the pride, the deceit, and the greed that animate action in this world. 
And Salekna demands full acceptance of both the impermanence of human life and the eternal suffering of samsara in order to accomplish this subjugation and abandonment of the body. So without that understanding, the fast will not fulfill its purpose. As a practice, Salekna traditionally refers to the lengthy preparatory fasting that precedes the total fast until death itself. And this period can be prescribed by scripture for durations of 12 years, 12 months, 12 fortnights, any kind of um, combination uh, of units of time measurement. So these durations can vary quite a bit in actuality, however they appear in scripture. And this preparatory period is called Niyam Salekna by Digumber Jains and simply Salekna by many Shwetambar Jains. Um, so the very fact, I just want to draw attention here to the fact that the canon prescribes a maximum period of 12 years for Salekna confirms that there isn't an idea here or an intention to hasten death from any kind of sudden withdrawal from food. So if death does not occur within the given time that one has declared or within this 12 years, the one who is fasting may give it up or start over again. Uh, so Salekna is not an active pursuit of death, but rather an acceptance and a measured embrace of it. The second term, Shwetambar Jains more often use this Prakrit derived term Santara or the Gujarati variation Santara, which is derived from the term for a bed of grass. It's the canonical deathbed on which the fasting person would, would make their place, their final resting place. The second concept practice here, right, is um, uh, distinguished from Niyam Salekna as what the Gumbergenes refer to as Yama Salekna, the feat that is undertaken once death is impending, the final fast. So it, in common use, it refers to the period of fast that culminates in the termination of the body, ideally begun after this longer preparation of Salekna as the resolute fast that leads to the person's mortal end with full awareness and wisdom and insight. So this step is meant to be taken only after receiving permission uh, from one's family or from a Jain guru or a senior mendicant, as well as the, the blessing of, of the community. So that depends somewhat, how that looks, depends somewhat on the sect of Jainism that the person belongs to, that the devotee belongs to. And the remaining life of such a person should not at the point of Santara be dependent on taking food alone. But in circumstances where taking regular food would not necessarily guarantee life, such as terminal sickness or very old age. So there are various types and stages of conditional or unconditional santara, each with its own prescriptive basis. And the strict rules that govern its correct practice are painstakingly detailed in, uh, in, in various Jain literature, the canonical texts of Jainism. And the third concept is samadhi maran. And this is a combination of samadhi or blissful contemplation of the soul and maran or giving up the body in death. So this concept, which has been translated as the peaceful voluntary death, differs a bit from the previous two in that Salekna and Santara outline particular practices or procedures of practice, whereas Samadhi Maran explains a meditative state of mind and the soul that proper practice facilitates and results in. So the rules for vows and fasting build up a kind of normative ethics of practice, but the notion of Samadhi Maran points to the ultimate effect on the soul of fasting until death governed by metaphysical law. And it also then implies the accordingly dire consequences of improper practice. So in canonical texts, Salekna is often presented in typologies of death. And some of these categories and distinctions are between voluntary and involuntary death, ignorant and enlightened or wise death, the Balamaran or Panditmaran. And these binaries might also be elaborated into uh, other typologies. For example, a five-fold typology based on deaths according to the Jain stages in the path to liberation, where you start with the, the highest form of the death of an omniscient, the Pandit Pandit Maran, a spiritually evolved or enlightened death of an ascetic as Pandit Maran, the self-realized laity who have partial vows, the Bal Pandit Maran, 
the self-realized lady without vows or Balmaran, and then the death of the unwise or ignorant Bal Balmaran. So a voluntary wise death is based on the conscious acceptance of its inevitability and embracing it without fear or desire. But each of these types can also be further broken down into a variety of terms that are based on quite granular distinctions of being with or without bodily movement, with or without thought. Uh, the degree of conditionality or the duration of the vow, the degree to which other people are allowed to serve or assist them, for example, turning the body to avoid bed sores and toileting, um, the location of the deathbed, and so forth. So th these descriptions of the fast that appear in important Jain scriptures um, include uh, Agamic texts, so the Acharanga Sutra, the Uttardhyana Sutra, the Tatvarta Sutra, and there are also texts that are exclusively devoted to the topic of Salekna, such as the Bhagavati Aradna. And it's mentioned in texts that are composed in Prakrit, in Sanskrit, as well as canon equivalent works and popular literature and commentaries uh, by Jain monks and nuns, as well as lay scholars in a variety of vernacular languages um, across sectarian divisions, so Hindi, Gujarati, Tamil, Kannada, and others. The scope of such a survey is really quite massive. Um, and canonical descriptions of the fast have most exhaustively been detailed in a compendium by Colonel Dr. Um, Espaya. And rather than attempt to summarize it uh, or reproduce it in some way here, I want to just focus briefly on the Bhagavati Aradna as a representative text in terms of outlining how the conditions for eligibility and the proper procedure of the fast are presented in Jain literature. There are basic conditions of possibility and procedures that are more or less consistent. Um, and there is an inviolable prohibition on anyone taking the fast who is young, healthy, or otherwise still able to live life that upholds Jain concepts of ethical or right conduct and fulfill those obligations. So except for urgent conditions such as floods, fires, fatal attacks, and so forth, um, which tend to refer to less common scenarios in modern life, or at least in urban modern life, um, the, these are the, con the constraints of the proper conditions for taking the fast. So invariably, a fasting person should endeavor to maintain equanimity and abide within awareness of the permanent soul throughout the fast, meaning they don't hate or fear death or cling to life or wish, wish to hasten death in order to escape pain or suffering. And the four essential features of a proper salekna or santara as described in the Acharanga Sutra illustrate this, uh, which are restraint, knowledge, pa patience, and detachment. And the procedure in simplified form follows a sequence of actions that are also laid out in these texts. And these include first, repenting for all negative acts in life. Second, letting go of attachment to loved ones after seeking their forgiveness for any wrongs done. And in the case of householders, they must also seek their permission uh, to take the fast. Third, accepting greater or lesser ascetic vows of conduct, depending on whether or not the person is already a mendicant or a householder, and depending on whether they belong to one sect or another, which have slightly different rules for this. Fourth, preparing the deathbed. Fifth, declaring the acceptance specifically of the vow to fast until death. Sixth, reciting the Nokar Mantra three times and other texts that identify the type of Santara to be taken as in whether or not it's conditional or unconditional. And seventh, finally, remaining in one place, having renounced food and all types of karma producing activity and thus overcoming attachment to the body until death occurs. Now, a key point here is that despite this relatively consistent uh, outline of eligibility and procedure, all these typologies highlight that scholars uh, over centuries have emphasized or prioritized a variety of viewpoints on aspects of practice that constitute an ideal ethical death, an ideal salekna, each one in its own correspondence with the aspiration toward the path uh, of nonviolence, toward the eradication of karma and liberation. So the fast until death eludes conceptual unity or procedural uniformity, even in the way that it appears in doctrine. 
Um, the picture of the fast and Jain canonical texts doesn't really constitute in this sense a prototypical, tr a true prototypical form that assures efficacy, right? So just following the procedure as it appears in text does not guarantee the true efficacy of the fast. And historian and scholar Shadak Shri Setar made the same observation on the basis of archaeological inscriptions that documented various historical instances of Salekna, um, where he notes that each of these terms accentuates specific ritual content. So the terms are not mutually exclusive in terms of representing a different ritual, but it also shows that there's no single formulaic experience of fasting until death but rather that the fast consists of ritualized austerities and abstentions and various combinations that result in the withdrawal of food and drink under many different conditions. Um, so the Jain terminology itself is already contingent on a variety of external circumstances like physical states, but also internal states or interior interiority, the subjectivity and karmic capacity of the fasting person. So how does Salekna happen? Um, briefly, before moving on to the legal material, I want to offer a little bit of reflection on how Salekna actually happens uh, for most lay Jains, as appeared in my fieldwork, how it unfolds within society. So in addition to the fragility of the body itself, these interdependent kind of configurations of family within the household and community relationships create the sorts of contingencies and vulnerabilities that open up religious practice, that open up ritual, and particularly open up salekna to contestation. And that's why it's important to, to look at this aspect of practice. So in terms of sectarian differences, the two major sects of Jainism, Digambar and Shotambar Jainism, differ on, on several points relevant here. Um, not, not just the sorts of texts that they take as authoritative in the Jain canon, but also their acceptance of whether or not women possess the physical and mental capacity to attain liberation. So where Digambar Jains do not generally hold that women can attain liberation, Shrutambar Jains, at least in theory, do. Um, though, as I noted before, moksha is not possible in this era, regardless of, of gender or embodiment. So among the Gumber Jains, also formal diksha or renunciation and adoption of mendicant vows is required, it's requisite before taking salekna. Um, so the fast is still, to the best of our knowledge, uh, primarily practiced by monks in the Digambar sect. And technically, there are then no actual lay salaknas uh, among the Gumbar Jains, whereas among the much larger Shratambar Jain population, the fast is overwhelmingly practiced by lay women, um, women who are householders, who rarely take Diksha before undertaking the fast until death. So my field work suggests um, what, what has been suggested in some other work as well, which is that it is particularly prevalent among Stanakvasi Jains in Shrutambar Jainism, though it is also practiced uh, by Terapanth and Murtipujak Jains as well. And over the last 15 years or so, following public interest litigation that contested the legality of the fast, and also a concurrent rise in social media and messaging apps, popular knowledge about Salekna and the aspiration to undertake this vow at the end of life has really spread and grown. Um, so since Shrutambar Jains do not have to take Diksha as a precondition, instead, after taking the permission of their family, the fasting person or their family members on their behalf will then seek the permission of a mendicant authority, usually a senior monk. And this process often involves some negotiation, right, as families don't always readily agree to the, the family members wish to take Salikna the first time that it is mentioned, especially in cases where there is not a or, or where there is a medical diagnosis of any condition, something like cancer, for example, where treatment or care might lead to the hope of recovery. So families will often urge the person to wait before they take the vow. And what we see here is that in many contemporary lay salaknas, there's what I identify in my work as a triangulation of agency, where the decision to undertake the vow is not only individual in terms of its voluntariness, but also a collective and shared kind of agency that is dispersed between the family and the spiritual authority of the mendicants who oversee the fast. 
So once permission has been granted and the vow is taken, announcements might be circulated in local patricas or newsletters, in WhatsApp groups, in Facebook pages, and so on, so that neighbors and members of the community can come to visit and pay their respects and take inspiration from the example of the person who has taken Salekna as a vow. Uh, part of the reason for the rise in practice might be attributed to the fact that, especially among lay Janes, its practice doesn't always adhere to that long preparatory period that is uh, consistent in scriptural kinds of presentations of the fast, except in emergent conditions, right? Frequently, it's actually practiced just hours or even sometimes minutes before death and in situations where, for example, there's an emergency situation or the person is in, in the hospital. And there's some disagreement about whether or not these new forms of fasting um, or are in fact fasts until death, whether they actually count as salikna or not, or whether it's become something more like a practice of giving last rites as a way of offering a Jain person religious comfort and faith uh, during death, that their death will lead to an auspicious rebirth in, in those difficult final hours or days. So as one monk um, put it during, during my field work, he said, there are santara and then there are santara, right? So there are distinctions to be made here. And the fast increasingly comes up in lay communities as a topic also of swadye, so philosophical study and discussion. Uh, but it's unknown at this time whether or not the practice will remain uh, embraced and as popular in the new generation as it is currently. So another thing to note about how Salekna happens in its social context is that after a death occurs, uh, a contemporary change that we've noted is the, the pomp and circumstance in which the person's samadhi is celebrated. So they might be placed in this noble seated position on the funeral palanquin as, as appears in the photograph here, which was formerly reserved for royalty and carried in a large procession to the cremation grounds. So this atmosphere of the Mahotsav, the large celebration, the festivities that might attend the person attaining samadhi uh, that often accompany Salekna is part of what drew the ire of the petitioner in the legal case. So in the writ petition, originally filed in the state of Rajasthan, the petitioner makes comparisons between Santara and Sati, or widow immolation, as well as to euthanasia, and claims that the practice constituted illegal suicide. So it petitions in this way both the constitutional domains of law and the criminal domains of law, right? The codes of the Indian Penal Code and the Constitution. And both suicide and euthanasia at the time that the suit was filed in 2006 were entirely illegal. And in the intervening years before the Supreme Court's ruling, uh, when they heard arguments, that were in the appeal of the Rajasthan High Court's ban, um, both of these were decriminalized, right? Suicide was actually removed from, and its abetment were removed from um, the Indian Penal Code, or rather I think suicide was, its abetment was not. Um, but suicide was decriminalized and euthanasia was at least partially decriminalized, passive euthanasia uh, in the intervening years here by other legislation. So, the fact is that it isn't just the kind of legal codes that are at stake in making these comparisons. It is the analogies that served to affirm prima facie the petitioner's claims that Santara was incommensurable with the right to life, that Salekna was incommensurable with the right to life and liberty guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution, which would make it subject to restrictions for the sake of public order or morality. And second, it would make it a criminal act in violation of the Indian Penal Code section 306 and 309. And those were the sections that, or are the sections that prohibit suicide and its abetment, right? And so this, uh, this allegation was not just that uh, Salekna could be suicidal, but also that families and communities celebrating it were abetting this kind of suicide. So these comparisons do a lot of rhetorical work, 
uh, not just legal work, but rhetorical work that tie together the legal reasoning, but also the moral logics that compelled the court to take up the question of Salekna's legality in the shadow of moral sensibilities that were tied to other reforms and restrictions. So as I mentioned, in 2015, the Rajasthan High Court heard the case and banned Salekna and directed the state to stop and abolish any form of the practice and register it as a criminal case. This decision led to widespread protests and public outcry from Jains across the country who denied Sony's claims, Nikhil Sony, the petitioner, and claimed constitutional protection for Salikna under the right to religious freedom in Article 25 of the Constitution. So this declared also or made the argument for declaring Salikna a so-called essential practice of Jainism, which is a doctrine that was introduced by the Supreme Court as a part of what is often and called judicial activism. And it was, only, it was only less than a year later than the 2015 high court ban in 2016 that the Supreme Court stayed at that ban. And they made Salekna provisionally legal without enshrining it under any explicit categorical protections. Right, so they did not designate it an essential practice and they did not designate it as overtly protected under Article 25. Um, and to date, they haven't heard any subsequent arguments. And as far as I understand, no further hearings are really expected. So I won't go into this too much now. But this sort of ambivalent conclusion that made Salekna legal um, follows a lot of recent legal scholarship that explores Article 21 in particular and the structural constraints on the Indian Supreme Court when they're adjudicating social action litigation under Article 21. Um, for example, heavily overloaded dockets that have been identified as leading to what are called weak remedies, weak legal remedies, where constitutional courts in India will often seek a modus vivendi rather than challenging any status quo. And, and this means a sort of provisional but open-ended arrangement that avoids making a determinative judgment. So in the description of this talk, I mentioned that the legal anthropological perspective here would draw on a genealogical imagination, which I want to just briefly define here. In this context, the term genealogical doesn't refer to a genetic or evolutionary line of descent, but rather to a method that was elaborated uh, by Michel Foucault, uh, social theorist Michel Foucault, that critically investigates causal and historical explanations in a way that is opposed to centralized or institutionalized notions of discourse. So instead, a genealogical imagination would point to the ways that relations of knowledge and power are embedded in a variety of practices and sources. So it's a method for understanding the present through multiple archives that include the material and the corporeal, the sort of bodily. And I've already alluded then to one genealogical strand, which has to do with the mechanism of law in public interest litigation as a way of bringing a case before the court. And that can evoke a whole strand of, of thinking about the case and interpretation of the issues in the case, which speaks to the minority position of Jains right, as a religious community in Indian society. And it ties into whether and how Jain religious practice might be subject to reform and regulation, which is what that kind of comparison to Sati does, that it evokes a history of the way that the law has regulated Hindu customs and personal law. These arguments point to a particular strand of genealogical investigation of Salekna in the law, in which the stakes of the litigation have been broadly problematized by Manisha Sethi, a legal scholar Manisha Sethi, as the tension of ritual death in a secular state, a so-called secular state. And her question centers on what happens when piety and belief are dragged into the courtroom where they seek denunciation or validation from uh, quote unquote, modern rational law. 
And the genealogy that Sethi is identifying here or producing is underscoring the Christian colonial and Orientalist legacy that endures in the Indian state's abhorrence of suicide. So where that rejection of suicide comes from. And that accounts for many of the defensive arguments that the Jain community had to make in this case, as well as academic work uh, that incisively deconstructs the legal and moral conflation of Salekna with suicide. So these arguments point out that the external body, biological life, and its attendant psychological states are the sole focus of what suicide seeks to extinguish. Whereas in Salekna, death is incidental to the ultimate aim of internally extinguishing karmic attachments to the body and to life and the bondage of those passions. So it is not a decision to die per se, but rather a decision of how to die upon accepting the inevitability of death. And these arguments further lay out how it is that Jain texts forbid suicide, that they declare it to be an ignorant form of death, quite contrary to a wise form of death, and that there is a difference in the manner of action or inaction where suicide is an act of violence, that there are divergent psychological states of mental equanimity and bliss in Salekna versus emotional distress uh, and disordered emotions driven by passions. Those are eradicated in Salekna, but they cause suicide. And similarly, convincing arguments have been made that Salekna is not a violent or coerced kind of custom like sati or honor killings, and that the lack of focus on the body and eliminating bodily pain and suffering differentiates it from euthanasia or mercy killing. And above all, all there's an ontological difference that's highlighted in which suicide is disgraceful to the soul that is the term that's used in the arguments where salekna is neither personal nor medical and is not an immolation but a promotion of the soul so i want to suggest that in discussions like sethis which are framed in terms of piety and modernity or belief and rationality there are certain moral concerns that are raised in the petition that frequently end up being neglected or treated as just additional context. They appear as sorts of eclectic fragments of legal precedent or argument or evidence in the law. And this is where I make my argument for the significance of ethnography as an intervention in these varied and overlapping kinds of reasoning that emerge in the case against Salekna. Because ethnography can fill in the picture of how Salekna is learned, how it is inherited as a form of ideal death, as a form of a good death, in very intimate ways from generation to generation within families, in ways that are left out of how family relationships are imagined by the state with a kind of suspicion of criminality. So I'll conclude this talk at what is actually the starting point for my research, which, which takes up what as yet has been only alluded to in the debunking of these comparisons between Sati and Salekna. And that is how gender animates moral logics and legal reasoning in response to a, a sort of persistent anxiety around voluntary death as a feminine mode of religious agency. So Sethi and others have already identified or observed that framing Salekna as a social evil depends at least in part on the assumption that it is a gendered practice, even though it is not a gendered practice in any formal sense. <clears throat> So Sony's petition leans on this example of a 60-year-old woman named Vimla Devi, who he described as being coerced by her family into taking the fast. And he emphasizes how Vimla Devi's fast was publicized and glorified like sati, right? And the glorification of sati is also a crime. So it centers the Jain woman as a subject who is most at risk of being victimized in the alleged crime or social evil of Salekna if this comparison with Sati were to stand. The public and sort of spectacular nature of Salekna and its celebration, which is typically announced in the community with, with visitation and public celebration, as previously mentioned, for Sony, that is akin to the glorification of Sati. But others have already reinterpreted that. For example, the anthropologist James Laidlaw has interpreted it instead as an authentication of the volition or voluntariness of the person undertaking the fast. 
which would distinguish it from the coercion of sati. Whitney Kelting has written on the meaning and reference of the term sati in Jainism to refer to virtuous women, but has no relation to the practice of widow immolation in Hinduism. So what we have here is an assortment of ways that the custom or practice of sati as a legal object and an example of religious reform have been differentiated from the Jain context. But my point, what I want to emphasize here, is that these anxieties around gender and voluntary death applied to Salekna don't fit for reasons that go beyond conceptual distinctions between Salekna and Sati and suicide. The underlying issue that I'm pointing to is that the Indian citizen, the Indian subject, might be imagined by the courts as Jane, right, a kind of minority religious subject citizen, or as a woman, or as an elderly person, or as a kind of uh, uh, intersection between the three, an elderly Jane woman. And each of these aspects of identity calls for a particular model of personhood that would demand certain responses from a liberal democratic state that involves reform or feminist politics, right? A certain kind of feminist reformist agenda from the law. However, the aspect of ascetic ethical subjectivity that is embodied in Salekna is unrecognizable to any model of social or legal ethics. Um, such, such politics really, it, it eludes the gaze of the state. And so the aged or gendered or communally identified subject of Salekna that is constructed or evoked in the law, this citizen subject, which is criminally neglected or coerced due to social devaluation, um, or the subject who makes claims to rights or protections, in the end winds up pointing back to a really striking transcendence of ascetic ethics. So it shows that the ascetic subjectivity, what is the heart of the kind of spiritual purpose of the enactment of Salekna is really quite invisible to the gaze of the state. It's a different model of personhood altogether. And, and that is what the sort of ethnographic and genealogical imagination together point to. So I'll I'll conclude there and um and I want to say Michami Dukadam for anything that has been uh, misrepresented or misunderstood here, any accidental harm I may have done in in doing this project. And I very much look forward to to hearing thoughts and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miki. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful talk. Do we have any questions? If we don't, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Sushma Ji to give her comments. Respected Dr. Shubhan Jain, Sri Sulek Jain sir, and uh, today's chief orator, Dr. Mickey Chase, all the members of International School for Jain Studies, Director Srinetraji Pandey, Coordinator Pragyaji Jain, and other scholars and invitees. I heartily congratulate the speaker for her this ninth lecture of monthly lecture series. She has aptly discussed the ethics of death and dying with brilliant exposition. She has explained about tapa, santhara, as culmination of lifetime of ascetic practice. She very rightly discussed how it is optional wo, not mandatory wo. Because of uh, human morality in decline, even with Sanlekhna, moksha won't be possible without the internal Bheda Vigyan or the introspection of the self. She has uh, mentioned the Digambars and Shvetambars practice of Sanlekhna and uh, the period of maximum 12 years to 12 months and 12 fortnights, etc explained the difference of Sanlekhna, Santhara, and Samadhi Maran, 
the types of samadhi maran like sanyas maran aradhana maran panchapad maran pandit maran and uh, uh, samadhi maran etc given the references from bhagavati aradhana and other jain literature she has explained proper procedure of the sanlekhana and uh, how sanlekhana actually happens from permission of family to the after death scenario uh, she put the triang uh, triangle of uh, agency person who is taking sanlekhana family and the the uh, inclusion of monks advice etc mentions about the legal position in light of nikhil soni's petition she has explained how santhara is not sati suicide and euthanasia and she has brought gender perspective that jain women mostly victimized and also through glorification women are coerced in fact i would like to uh, put some light on the that the section 309 of the indian P, indian penal code deals with suicide and prescribes punishment for an attempt to commit suicide similarly these are provisions which criminalize abetment of attempt to suicide this was the only safeguard against the instigation of sati in india for a long long time she has rightly explained the difference between sati suicide and euthanasia etc i would like to add justice t k tukol in his book sallekhna is not suicide defines suicide as killing oneself by means employed by oneself however samadhi maran practice does not fall under the purview of this law he says to be an offense an act must cause injury to others whereas santhara or samadhi maran cause no injury to self or others the goal of an aspirant of santhara is to experience and observe own independent conscious self in the course of natural death and break release or release the bondage of body with binding karmas she has also put this in a right way and i'd like to put the article 21 of the constitution of india which provides a right to life and liberty that is protection of life and personal liberty i quote no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law interpreting this article 21 various courts and finally the supreme court has held that right to life does not include it in it the right to die but when it was confronted with the issue of euthanasia it has famously held that right to life would include in it the right to die with dignity here the question whether right to life would include the right to observe one's own natural death as in the practice of sanlekhana is still remain unanswered by the court here i would like to cite uh, some case laws uh, if time permits me i'll i'll just try to uh, sum up in uh, some minutes uh, maruti dubal versus state of maharashtra despondent with inaction of government authorities a police constable maruti dubal tried to immolate himself outside the office of bombay bombay's municipal commissioner when criminal charges were pressed when criminal charges were passed against him he challenged section 309 of the ipc in the bombay high court saying that it violates articles 14 and 21 of the constitution constitutional right to live includes right not to live or right to end oneself 309 ipc was held here ultra virus or beyond the universe hence 
it was said that it is constitutionally not permissible to penalize suicide. Next case in Supreme Court, P. Rathinam versus Union of India, case hearing a detail, uh, I'm not going into detail, court held section 309 contravened to the right to life under Article 21, but this judgment in Rathinam did not hold long. In Gyan Kaur versus State of Punjab, uh, abetting suicide is also held unconstitutional. But this logic was rejected by Supreme Court, which overruled the judgment in Rathinam and ruled afresh that the Constitution's right to life did not include right to die. So Section 309 was once again held to be constitutional. The debate long debate went very long, but ultimately, <clears throat> in short, as she said, we can say that Santhara is in no case violative of Article 21. It is just observing natural death by one's own will. The aspirant is de deciding to look into his own natural death. I'll say, San Lekhana. Lekhan is to observe also. Lekhan is to make thin the kashayas and the body, but Lekhan is to see. So, what to observe? Observing own natural death and observing the self, which are different. Through Bheda Vigyan, she has also mentioned that when all the worldly things are known as Nashwar, etc. It is not an act of poverty undertaken under societal pressure or as a reaction, as is suicide, nor a decision based on inflict of emotions and pressure, as in Sati, nor is it an easy solution to pain, as in euthanasia. Sanlekhana is not to put one's body to gain anything as in hunger strike, nor is it using the body as a site of protest. It has no ill effects on society and there is no question of affecting public order. It does not cause danger to public health. Sanlekhana is in no way ritual against morality. In fact, it is in pursuance of greater morality. It causes no injury to self or others. Such differences cannot be ignored. And she has rightly and scholarly presented all the details of Salekna, Santara, and Samadhi Maran that this uh, it is different from suicide, sati, euthanasia, hunger strike, or fast unto death. It is none of it. This difference must be appreciated by all. I thank all the authorities and to have such elucidated lecture to be uh, and to listen to her expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sushma Ji. Thank you so much. I remember the sentence from uh, Dr. Mickey's uh, slides. Uh, it is about, it is not about a right to die. It is about the right how to die. So there is a difference which we need to understand. And there are a few questions I would request all of you to stay and discuss. We will take the question from uh, the first question from Nitin Shah. Uh, if you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, we enjoyed uh, the presentation, Professor Chase. I have a question. If you find something from the literature, I certainly uh, have written a little paper on modified Salekna years ago. A uh, question that I have is, is there a distinction in the scripture in your research between someone who is facing death because of terminal disease versus someone who is willing to take Salekna just because the person feels he or she is at the end of the road because of age or something, but do not have a terminal medical condition. Thank you. Dr. Chase. Uh, yes. So yeah. um, I'll just respond briefly. 
So from my reading of scripture, I have not found any specific such distinction. Um, again, what I see in scripture is usually laid out in terms of a list of enumerated conditions under which a person would be eligible to decide to take the fast. And I think that part of what we're seeing now in contemporary practice is because of the medicalization of death in which diagnoses are possible, even the idea of of terminal illness um, is one that is increasingly debated around thinking about these conditions of eligibility. Whereas what appears more in scripture is determining uh, whether or not the person is capable of upholding their vows, upholding the proper conduct that would allow them to live uh, a life by the principles of, of, of properly observing Jainism. And so it's less about terminal illness and more about whatever it is that the condition of the body and mind are in that would allow them to um, consciously and in full senses make the vow, um, but at a point where they're no longer able to uphold their other obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shah. Uh, I have Dr. Srinivasan to ask his question. Uh, am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. We can hear you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael Chase, for your excellent presentation on Jainism of Salekana. It's uh, really mind blowing, I would say. I have just jotted down some 14 points out of your lecture, but I'm not going to ask all those things and frighten you, but only short and sweet, I'll ask some. Uh, in two sessions, one is part one, and the other one is part two. Part one, I have the commonality between the Hinduism and Jainism as far as uh, fasting is concerned. You say tapas, here we say pratyahara, that is the Ashtanga Yoga. You call it as yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. So there is first point number one. And the second point is about the purpose is for moksha. That is what everybody is striving for. Even in Padanjali Yoga Sutra, in chapter, uh, uh, I mean, I will come to that. Purpose is moksha. That is what says is in Padanjali Yoga Sutra, where one can attain the Kaivalya Samadhi only through the practice of Ashtanga Yoga and through tapas and meditation. And then, how does it differ from Dharma Mega Samadhi and Samadhi Varana? This is my very uh, interesting question. Dharma Mega Samadhi is, uh, you can find it in Padanjali Yoga Sutra, fourth chapter, Sutra 29. Prasankhyane Abhyahu Siddhasya Sarvada Vivekyade Dharma Mega Samadhi. That means the yogi who attains the Mental wisdom, the Vedic jnana, is liberated from uh, the clutches of all this mundane world and he enters into the Dharma Mega Samadhi cloud of virtues and then finally the Kaival Samadhi. The fourth point is very interesting point. When Hinduism permits a yogi to go on Samadhi state, on various state level, that is, there are about 10 states of Samadhi, when a yogi is permitted to go on Samadhi state to attain Kaivalya, Moksha, freedom, or liberation, from consciousness state to non-conscious state of meditation, how is it that the courts are ruling out Salekana is something really disturbing me. That I don't know whether you have quoted all these points in the court or not, it is yet to be seen. When what prevents a court to rule out this Salekana or Santara is my, I mean, innate question to make a chase. The Santara's lack of focus of the body and eliminating body suffering differentiate from Uthanesia. Yes, perfectly agree. This is what even in the 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 Nirbija Samadhi and Dharma Mega Samadhi and after, and finally reaching the uh, the Kaivalya Samadhi through 
the roasting of seeds, the karmas, and the vasanas. So these are the main questions which I would like to ask you. And what are those four passions in Santara called? Uh, if you can kindly explain me, I'd be very grateful and thankful to Mickey Chase and all the I mean, others. And thank you for the nice opportunity given to me. Thank you, Vera. Dr. Chase. So um, just to start with the last, the, the four passions that are identified in, in Jainism are krod or anger, man or pride or ego, maya or deceit, and lob or greed. Um, so those are the passions that are identified here in, in this formulation. Um, I really appreciate the erudite nature of that question. I think there's a great deal that you talked about uh, in thinking about the comparative framework with Hinduism that I will take into account for further study and research. It's not something that I have focused on thus far. Um, I will mention just very briefly, although this is a drop in the bucket to what your what your question raised, um, that prayopavesha or the, the fast until death that is found in Hinduism was mentioned as a part of the arguments that were made before the court in order to point out that um, that particular practice had not been uh, the target of accusations and comparisons similar to those made against Salekna. Um, and so there, there is a, a kind of um, valid digging into the two traditions that have similar fasting practices on the surface of them and, and whether or not they raise the same kinds of um, suspicion from the state and from society. Uh, and then I'll also mention just very briefly in response to the second question that you mentioned, um, or the second point that you raised, that moksha is not always the aim of practicing salekna, especially in the present time in which moksha is not possible, that I found this to be borne out as well in my ethnographic field work. Um, for example, one of the most beautiful uh, cases of Salikna, one of the most beautiful stories that I was able to hear from a son of a woman who took Salikna was that she was focused in an incredibly um, concentrated way on being reborn with Simandar Swami. And that was actually the, the, the focus of her undertaking that fast, that her gaze remained fixed on an image of Simandar Swami, that that was what she said when she decided to take the vow, that now she would only, uh, she would would only take food, she would only take water, she would only take um, any of the comforts of, of, of any of the material life once she had already been reborn in a, a place where moksha was possible, but particularly with Samandar Swami. So I think that there are ways that I have seen different examples of fasting people articulate their aspiration for what it is that might come in a future lifetime. Um, that falls short of total moksha. Um, but I, I request, please, um, that anyone who has references or thoughts to share, uh, I, I can certainly benefit from them. And I'll put my email address in the chat. And, uh, and I would absolutely love it if, if anyone wanted to email me with their thoughts uh, as well. Yeah, as we know, Dr. Ch Dr. Chase has to rush somewhere, so we will not take any more questions. And anyway, this topic is uh, such a deep. I would like to we... just give one reference uh, yes, regarding the question that uh, Mahakavi Kalidas said in Raghuvansha, "Shaishave Vyastha Vidya Nam Yavane Vishayishanam." Then he said, "Yoga Nante Tanutya Dam." In the last, when he thinks that. Death is inevitable. So one should die calmly and peacefully and therefore he takes the support of yoga, samadhi. So yogen ante tanutyadam, vardhakke munivritti nam. So this, there are references and when he says about kaivalya, kaivalya means what? The only self. He observes and the only self remains and the body he just observes the difference between decaying body and the remaining self. So that Bheda Vigyan gives the culmination of Kaivalya Gyan. So there, there uh, it, it is very well, uh, I mean, very well uh, comparable with the Hindu philosophy and the Santara this way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singhvi, for your insights. I think I will just... Uh, uh, 
uh, I will ask Dr. Chase to put her email so that uh, those who have questions, they can ask her directly. And, uh, and they can also ask us at IHS. I would request our president, Dr. Shugar Chanji, to uh, come ahead and uh, say a few words for word of thanks. Thank you, Pajya. Uh, I first thank uh, uh, Michelle, uh, you know, for an excellent presentation. I will say it's a very, uh, Mickey, it's a very good start that you have made and keep it up because the question asked by, for example, Dr. Srinivasan and, you know, some issues raised by our chairperson, they are the pointers for more understanding. Similarly, you know, if you study how some states in United States, like Oregon and others, they have made it legal. So why have they made it legal? Okay. And the most important thing that I would suggest is that we must, you know, appreciate the difference between Sadlejna, Samadhi Maran, and Sankara. Sadlejna is not like, you know, Satta writes two books, pursuing death and inviting death. So Sadlejna is not dying. It is preparing yourself to die peacefully. And so, and that's why they say it can be 12 years maximum and then you start, you know, controlling your activities, not just food. Food is an aspect. But Samthara and Sam Samadhi Maran, these are the end stages. Like when you you see that the death is there, so then you accelerate the process of Sandeshna. So it, like, you know, uh, Sushmaji said that Samadhi Maran, you forget everything and you focus on your own soul. And the objective may not be moksha, because as you said in this cosmic cycle, moksha is not possible. So idea is that we are trying to thin our karma, karmic bonding, and unmeritorious karma. So, Mickey, thank you very much. And I thank Sushmaji for really educating me on the subject through your deep research of Kalidas and others. And Srinivasanji, you brought up, you know, excellent, you know, rendition from Patanji's yoga or whatever it is. And all of the other Dr. Nitin Shah. Thank you all very much. And I hope that we have similar meetings and speakers in our this series. And above all, Pragya, thank you very much for being an excellent organizer. Okay. Thank you so Bye. much. Uh, so I think it's time and uh, we shall uh, wind up today and hope to see you soon in the next month with a new topic a new lecturer a new speaker thank you so much thank you very much uh, happy diwali jai jinendra thank you